And um, so then uh, Cindy Richardson had her um, doctors with today for the breast cancer and uh, again, good information. Um, so I have scheduled the, um, when she does the next surgery, so it'll be a few weeks, but she felt really good about the information and her doctor and everything too. So, so um, that one, and then there's one oh, more. Barb, maybe? Who? Barb? I think. Yeah, her eye surgery is next week. So. February 1st, yeah, yeah. It's next, a week from tomorrow. Uh, um, but yeah, so um, lots of things are going on, lots of prayers needed. So, but again, they're feeling God's presence, they're feeling the church caring for them, they're feeling the prayers. So, as I've talked to different people, um, oh, yeah, there's Tanya. To Tanya's surgery was delayed. She was supposed to have breast cancer surgery and have the lymph nodes that was delayed. Um, and so hopefully next week they can do that. So other medical conditions. So uh, so pray for that next step as well. So so and Tanya's our custodian. If you don't know. So. Oh, and my brother-in-law drove himself to ER. We haven't heard from him. No. Um, yeah, and we also have a, a teacher at uh, the preschool daycare slash daycare that um, he is in uh, Fort Wayne. Again, prayers for him as they're trying to discover her, um, what's on the brain. So there's two, one on each side, something there. So, mm -hmm. so and his name is Dustin. So prayers for that. So for him. Yeah. Well, now, after yeah. all these uh, <laughs> prayer requests and prayer updates, uh, if you were wondering whether you had anything to pray for, we all have something to pray for, and we also have things to be grateful for. You know, we had two people that uh, went to the hospital, and probably 15 years ago, they yeah. wouldn't have made it. And, so one's coming home tomorrow and we're praying for a surgery for the other one this afternoon. So let's remember and keep all of these people and plus the unspoken prayer requests that we haven't made yet. Keep all those on our mind. I could add one more. Is that all right? Mm -hmm. Linda's uh, sister-in-law, <clears throat> her brother's wife from South Carolina, had uh, breast cancer about 24 years ago. And uh, last week she found out that it returned. Um, she's got about a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter mass in her left lung. And uh, probably will be treated so that uh, she can uh, keep going as long as she can. <clears throat> Uh, they're not planning any surgery. She's uh, 79, I think, uh, but a trooper. She's a believer. Um, wonderful lady, but uh, has to deal with this going forward. So she has two children. Uh, so if you could pray for all four of them, that'd be helpful. Well, um, a lot of times when we talk and we hear someone say that they're a believer, I mean, it makes all the difference. I mean, hope versus hopeless. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Good. I sent her a copy of the anthem we sing uh -huh. in church Sunday. Yeah. Just to know, just information, uh, I could hardly believe it, extended uh, Facebook mess messenger conversation with a friend overseas in Liberia. His wife has been in Ganta for seven months. She completed the chemotherapy and they could not do surgery. She needs to come home to Liberia. And I'm questioning him mm -hmm. about like, why, why, why doesn't she do her chemotherapy in Liberia? There is no hospital or mm -hmm. clinic in Liberia that gives that kind of air. Well, I checked it out on Google. It's true. Uh, and so her only hope is to go to India now because they can't do the surgery. 
So with all of this, you know, we have such a wealth of places to go yes. <laughs> for treatment. Be thankful because he's desperate. Sometimes we don't understand or the blessings that we have. Amen. Yeah. Okay. I welcome everyone to the Grace and Trinity uh, Wednesday Bible study. We're continuing our study the second week on the uh, Epic of Eden, the the book of Isaiah. We had our introduction last week. We'll do the first session this week. And uh, you'll get to see a little bit more of uh, Dr. Rever Reverend Dr. Sandra Richard, Richter, who is the author. And uh, as we go through this, I think today's session is a very good session. And tomorrow or next week's session is a very good session. And the third session is very good. Um, we've asked you to do some homework. And so the homework for this week was to have done the day two and day three lesson for the first week. And uh, I hope that you'll keep up with that because it's the meat on the bone. And so I, I hope you'll continue and strive to do that. I know that uh, some of you have busy schedules. I'm talking about myself here. <laughs> and uh, you didn't do your homework until yesterday. <laughs> but uh, uh, I hope that you will uh, keep up with that. And I think we'll open with prayer and then uh, we'll watch the video. And because uh, the video will help to frame your assignments, I think, a little bit that you did. So uh, would you join me in prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for our time together. Lord, every day is a blessing. And sometimes it takes a wake-up call for us to understand how truly blessed we are. All the opportunities we have for health care. All the opportunities we have to stay warm on cold winter nights. All the opportunities we have to come into worship and to worship you without fear. Lord, we're grateful for all of these blessings and the many more blessings that are beyond our wildest understandings until we start to lose them. And then we might recognize more fully how you have been with us and watched over us through all these years. Lord, for each and every one of these prayer requests that we have lifted up beforehand, each of these people who are on our hearts and on our minds, we lift them up once again, recognizing that you are the source of every good and decent thing that we have, that you know best. And in each of these situations, that so we can trust the outcome to you. Lord, you know our hearts. You know how much we love you. And I pray that you would continue to kindle within each of us that love through the outpouring of your grace and mercy. We're grateful for all that your son has done for us. And we're grateful for a prophet from 2,700 or so years ago, Lord, that you used in such a mighty way that you used to call attention to not just what was going on then, but what would be going on 700 years later. Lord, as we continue to study the book of Isaiah, we pray that you would open our eyes, that you would open our ears, that we would be willing to hear as you call into our lives once more through this mighty prophet, through this great man, and perhaps the greatest thing about him was that he heard your call, he answered, and as Samuel said, here I am. May we all be here when you call. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And just here too, that there, we do have some people from Grace that are, are able to go to the seven o'clock service. So again, we've got more people going to the Bible study. So we're excited about, you know, having a good crowd there as well. So.
They have a pretty good group over there. Mm -hmm. Great. Not as good as this. I mean, I don't know. <laughs> if that was coming. That quality or numbers. <laughs> we had a little technical difficulty before with uh, my sister and my parents at our house, and so I had stopped everything and Did not remember to start. Well, you're way ahead of me, John. So thank you so much for all that you do. First thing, what do we start with? First, well, thing, like the first thing. thing <laughs> <laughs> So welcome to our first section on the book of Isaiah, uh, titled Appropriately First Things. We are going to be diving into the great book of Isaiah. I'm sorry, I pushed the wrong button. We wouldn't have known that. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> I am Sandy Richter, and I'm thrilled to be a part of the Seedbed production. So what are we working on? We're going to focus in on The Great Prophet, a book that most people would identify as one of the greatest books out of the Old Testament, one of the champions of our prophets. His name is Isaiah. His book has got 66 chapters in it, which is an overwhelming number of chapters to study. So one of my primary jobs is going to be to take this book and to organize it for you so that you can uh, gain access to it, so that you can organize it, so you can make sense of it, so that you can study it and you can teach others this book as well. Now, most people would look at the prophet Isaiah and they would identify him as the greatest of the major prophets. The greatest. Why is he the greatest? Well, part of it has to do with that 66 chapters. It's a very big book bigger than Jeremiah, bigger than Ezekiel. It's a large book. But more than that, Isaiah is identified as the greatest of the major prophets because of his statements about the coming Messiah. Isaiah has more to say about Israel's Messiah than any other prophet in the Old Covenant. He is quoted more than 60 times in the New Testament and quoted in every possible genre. You will find him in the Gospels, in the Book of Acts, in the Epistles. He's everywhere. And he's everywhere because this character has more to say about Israel's coming Messiah than any other character coming out of the Old Testament. In fact, in many contexts, he's known as the fifth gospel. The fifth gospel. To the point where when the gospel writer John is speaking of Jesus' last days on earth, he says, Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. So Isaiah is here to tell us about Israel's coming Messiah. He's identified as the fifth gospel, and he is quoted throughout your New Testament. Now, in these studies that we are approaching with Isaiah, we're going to struggle with this book. Mm -hmm. We're going to struggle with the book because it's large, but the biggest reason we're going to struggle is because there is a barrier that stands between us and Isaiah himself. Now, for those of you who've done the Epic of Eden, Introduction to the Old Testament, you know all about this great barrier. You've heard about the problems of history and geography and genre that stand between us and them. We've actually got some additional barriers when we step into Isaiah's world. And the first one that we would encounter is the very question of what is a prophet? You know, what, what was a prophet in the ancient world? What did they do? Who did they speak to? This is going to be an issue that we'll address, and we'll address it in our next set of studies. The next question we're going to have to ask is who is Isaiah talking to and why? Now, this actually is the core of the issue in approaching any prophetic book. Like the epistles of the New Testament, you really only get half the conversation. 
You know that Isaiah is speaking. You know that he must have an audience. You hear the issues that are heavy on his heart, but you don't know why he's speaking to this audience and you don't know who they are. In other words, you've got half the conversation. My job is going to be to provide the other half of the conversation. I'm the person who needs to step, step in here and paint an historical backdrop and give you some uh, societal details and reasons for Isaiah's oracles. In painting that backdrop, I'm hopefully going to provide for you the other half of the conversation. So what is the prophet? Who is Isaiah talking to and why? And how do I go about interpreting prophecy? This is another major issue because we need some tools here for taking these ancient words and moving them into uh, our current situations. So these are some of the questions that we're going to have to ask and answer over the course of our eight sessions together. And we're going to start off here with the issue of what is a prophet or even uh, more uh, idiomatically prophet talk in biblical studies. Now, for those of you who've already gotten rolling with your study guides, you've been introduced to some of the in-house lingo and you've seen that there are different groups within the canon of the Old Testament. And you've actually seen that the Christian canon is different from the Jewish canon. Now, it's not different in the books that they include, but it's different in how they're organized and how they're named. So in the Jewish canon, they will speak of former and latter prophets. And the reason for this is, according to the Jewish idea of revelation and inspiration, only a prophet can truly speak the words of God. So the books you would identify as the historical books from Joshua through 2 Kings, and that's what the Christian canon would call them, the historical books. Well, a Jew is going to call these the former prophets because they're going to understand that only a prophet could write those books. So Joshua through 2 Kings are the former prophets, and then everything you know as a writing prophet is going to be identified as a latter prophet. So Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and the 12 are the latter prophets by the Jewish canon. Okay, what about major versus minor? Well, the major prophets, as you probably know, are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. These are names you've known since you were knee-high to a grasshopper. And the 12 are the minor prophets. Now, what's the difference here? Are they different in their importance? Is one really important and one not so important? Not at all. The difference is the length of the book. So Isaiah has 66 chapters. Micah has seven chapters. What is that about? It's simply the number of oracles that the Christian community decided these belong in the book. It has nothing to do with importance. So Isaiah is going to be identified as a major prophet. What about office versus gift? Well, that's something we have to get to as well. But for now, you need to realize that Isaiah held the office of prophet, the office of prophet, not just the gift. And we'll find the difference as we move ahead. Okay, what about interpreting these books? Some ground rules. A word that's going to get thrown around periodically in our lessons is the word hermeneutics. This is a 75 cent word. It might sound intimidating, but all it means is the interpretation of scripture, the science of interpreting scripture. And it actually is a science, even though everyone who comes down the street thinks that they can interpret anything they want out of the biblical text, uh, not so. There, there are some rules. So what are the hermeneutics of prophecy or what in the world is a prophetic book? Well, the first thing we need to know is that these books, although they're named for characters, are not actually biographies. This book, of Isaiah is not about Isaiah. In fact, Isaiah isn't even introduced until chapter six. This book, rather in, than being a biography, is actually an anthology. And it's an anthology of oracles or sermons, you might call them. In other words, Isaiah's a preacher. And he's been preaching all his life. 45 years, this man preaches. Now, if you think about the average preacher, preaching once, twice, maybe even three times a week for 45 years. Do the math. That's over 6,000 sermons. That's a lot of preaching. Now, Isaiah, the longest Old Testament prophetic book, has 66 chapters. But for a man who preached for 45 years, that's 1% of his sermons. 
So the community of faith approached this collection of oracles and said, this 1% by the witness of the Holy Spirit belongs in canon. And that 1% needs to be collected into an anthology. And then that anthology needs to be organized. This is what a prophetic book is. So the book of Micah is not about Micah. The book of Jeremiah is not about Jeremiah. Rather, it is collections of their sermons, the best and the brightest, right? Collected for the community of faith to speak to future generations. So how are these anthologies organized? Well, again, you might make the conclusion that these anthologies should be organized chronologically, and they're not at all. We do not start with uh, the first sermon that Isaiah preached and run all the way through to the last sermon he preached. No, rather, when these anthologies are collected, they're collected around themes. And specifically in our book, the theme for the first half of the book is going to be the theme of judgment. And the theme for the second half of the book is going to be the theme of restoration in the broadest of terms. Now, obviously, there's restoration in the first half and there's judgment in the second half. But those are the overarching categories. And then there are minor subplots as well, just like you might find in your hymnal that is organized around Christmas and Easter or baptism. This is what's going to happen to these books as well. So what that teaches us is that the discrete oracle is very important. We're very interested in chapter one of Isaiah and what it has to say in its introduction and conclusion. But we're also going to be paying attention to how these oracles are organized, because the organization of these anthologies is going to say as much to us as the actual oracles themselves. Now, what else? Do we well, they're extremely situational. Uh, I spoke of how we've only got half the conversation and we need the other half of the conversation. <laughs> well, the situation, the context, who is Isaiah speaking to and why is he speaking to them? These situations are critically important to the interpretation of Christ. And that's going to be my job as we move through this study. I have to provide that information for you. And then you have to do the work of actually interpreting the oracle in light of that background. And a lot of your weekly work that you do as individuals is going to feed into that process. So extremely uh, situational context is king. Absolutely king. We have to discover the situation in which these words are spoken, or there is no way that we're going to follow them. Let me give you an example. Listen to these words. I have a dream. Do I need to go any further? Mm -hmm. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. Do you know who the preacher was? Mm -hmm. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at a table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a desert state sweltering with the heat of injustice and oppression will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I don't have to tell you who the preacher is. I don't have to tell you what the context is. I don't have to do anything but read these words and all of us are crushed by them. I have a dream. It's my favorite line, that my four children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Mm -hmm. I have dreams. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Now, when I hear those words, I have trouble not bursting into tears every time I hear those words. And the reason is because I know their context. See, I'm an American. And I know about the story of African slavery in my nation's past. I know about the civil rights movement that really hasn't worked yet. And I live every day of my life with the consequences of the national sin of my people. So no one has to tell me that's Martin Luther King Jr. No one has to tell me where or why he was preaching. And his words fall upon me with a weight that changes me. This is what we want when we read the book of Isaiah. We want to provide the context, the situation, the crisis, so that when Isaiah speaks, it has the same impact on my heart and my life as when Martin Luther King Jr. speaks. But the only way that's going to happen is if we discover the other half of the conversation. So that's where we're headed. 
and our hermeneutics are going to pursue that goal. Okay, so how are these books organized? I've spoken of how they're anthologies and that the order of the, chron the uh, oracles themselves are not necessarily chronological. We thought in terms of a preacher who's collected all of these sermons over a life of ministry, and then through his work and the work of his disciples, all of these sermons are organized and put into a final form. That final form in the prophetic books is going to be as thematic, as theological as it is anything else. Now, as we move into Isaiah, we're going to see that there are historical portions in the book. There are a couple of chapters that tell narratives, but almost exclusively we're dealing with sermons. And the thematic order of these discrete sermons is going to make a difference. But of course, organizing that is going to be a great challenge for us because we're modern readers. And we look at this and we say, how in the world is Isaiah putting this book together? Okay, well, good news. Isaiah actually told us how he's putting this book together. So we're not going to have to just impose a structure on the book. Rather, we're going to be able to tease a structure from the book. I first learned the structure from um, a Yale scholar, Brevard Childs. And what he points out is that the first half of the book, Isaiah 1 through 39, really, according to the prophet's own words, is described as the former things. Whereas the latter half of the book, Isaiah 40 through 66, the prophet himself describes as the latter things. And here, uh, in this particular passage we've got up on the screen, and six other times in the book, we hear the prophet telling us this. He's a good teacher. He tells us about the structure. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare new things. Before they spring forth, I declare them to you. Why is he doing this? Well, the prophet wants his audience to know, look, this is the word of God, and I told you about the former things, and they came to pass. I, I was right. I was a true prophet of the Almighty. So now I'm going to tell you about the latter things, things you're going to have even more trouble believing. And because I've earned my credibility, you need to believe them too. So the former things and the latter things, 1 through 39, 40 through 66, how would we describe the former things? Well, as it says on the screen, Israel's sin and impending judgment. This is the thesis of the first half of the book. The former things are a description of judgment, a description of what I like to say is Israel as she was. But the latter half of the book is a description of hope and restoration, or as I like to say, Israel as she will be. What we see in the structure, what we want to pick up from the theme here, is that our prophet is letting us know that by the very organization of these oracles, these sermons, that restoration comes after judgment. That judgment is never our God's final word. Judgment is necessary. Discipline is essential. Israel has to change. But that's not the end. God will never abandon the repentant heart. Rather, he takes the former things and he transforms them into the latter things. So that by the time we get to Isaiah chapter 66, we hear the prophet asking the question, can a land be born in a single day? And shouting the answer back, you bet it can. <laughs> and so what we learn here is that although the world is broken and although God's people have failed and although the first servant is an absolute mess, God is stepping into this story to transform that servant, to heal that world and to come up with a whole new story. So the former things, we could read the quote out of Isaiah chapter one, alas, O sinful nation. People weighed down with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, sons who act corruptly. They have abandoned the Lord. They've despised the Holy One of Israel. And then we turn to chapter 60 and we hear, arise, shine, fear, light has come. And the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. This is the structure of the book, a structure that is supposed to convince the audience that God has not done with them yet. That he truly is the God of second chances, to quote Archibald Vesperius, and that the judgment of the first half is not the final word. Now, 
uh, we're going to need to uh, detail this a little bit further because not only do we have the former and the latter things, but we also have a book that actually addresses three different historical eras. The first historical era is Isaiah's own lifetime, and that is 742 to 700 BC. It was a long time ago, right? And this would be the general setting of Oracles 1 through 39. It's not exhaustive, but the general setting. Now, Isaiah's own lifetime is a time of prosperity. This is a time of peace, national spirit. This is a time when nobody believes that anything bad could happen or that God could possibly be angry at us because I got money in the checkbook. God can't be mad at me. I got two cars in my garage and one of them's a Prius. This is good. Yeah, <laughs> life is good. So this is a period where Israel doesn't think judgment is coming. Isn't that interesting how we think about our lives that way? As long as my needs are met, God must be happy with me. But as soon as, as, soon as someone bombs the seer's tower, God's not happy with me anymore. Hmm, interesting. Okay, that's the first period of this book. The second period is the exile. And the exile is a time of profound anxiety and loss for Israel. Because what will happen in uh, six, starting in 605 BC is that Israel will start losing ground to her enemies. And because of her accumulated sin, God will finally enact the covenant curses of Deuteronomy chapter 28. And these people who had been the privileged and blessed and secure people of God are going to wind up being the prey of their opponents. And in 586 BC, this nation is going to collapse, and these people are going to lose everything. When I say lose everything, I mean certainly their jobs and their houses, but also their families and their place in society and their identity. They're going to become a nation of refugees. If you can picture old money, high-class Israelites being dragged out of their capital city, tied one to the next with nothing but the clothes on the back, then you can picture the exile. If you can think about the Nazi death marches of 44 and 45, if you can think about District 12 in the Hunger Games, this is the exile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they lose everything. That would be 255. The final wave of this book happens from 539 to 400, and this is the return and the restoration, where God starts speaking through his prophet, arise, shine, because a light has come to you. So we've got three different eras, for sure, and with these three different eras, we also have three different theological movements. Isaiah's lifetime is primarily a discussion of the covenant lawsuit. Covenant lawsuit against Israel and against the nation. The exile, 40 through 55, is primarily a conversation about Yahweh's restoration in light of how profoundly broken these people are. Living in refugee camps in the suburbs, well, the, the squalor of the ghettos of Babylon. And then the return, this third theological movement, is Yahweh's future plan for Israel. And the thing that's going to surprise the prophet and surprise his audience is that this future plan for Israel is way bigger than anybody ever dreamed. This prophet, unlike any other prophet in the Old Testament, he can see the horizon and he sees a baby born in Bethlehem on that horizon. He's like three stanzas with the song, and the song's not finished until we get all the way through. Now, how in the world are you going to organize all of this? Well, we've got some work to do. But one thing we're going to do that's going to help you is we are providing a map to the book. Because a good map gets you where you're going. And for someone like me who cannot find my way out of the paper bag, if it weren't for GPSs on phones, I would be a complete lost cause. <laughs> okay, so this is abbreviated map that you're looking at on the screen. You have among the materials in your study guide, you have a detailed map. And as we look at this, we see that uh, we identify that Isaiah 39 and 40 through 66 are separate parts of the book. Not separate parts of the book. Pastor but Jeannie two gave you an expanded copy. or enlarged this copy of the last. This is the former things and the latter things. And this is a, a very important divide within the book structure. As we look at the first portion of Isaiah, we see that there's an introduction. And that introduction runs from chapters 1 through 6. Chapter 1 is actually a covenant lawsuit between Yahweh and his people. Yahweh is suing Israel. He's dragged her into court. 
and he's uh, laying his accusations on the table. We'll get to that next session. So obviously, chapter one introduces us to a book that is not about Isaiah. It's a book that's about Israel and Israel's relationship with Yahweh. As we reach the end of that introduction, we're given a word of hope. And the word of hope is actually Isaiah's calling narrative. This is when we're first introduced to our prophets. And that calling narrative is something you've probably heard a thousand times at every missions convention you've ever attended, right? Here am I, send me, Lord. I saw mm -hmm. the Lord, he was high, lifted up. This is Isaiah's calling narrative. We'll focus in on this before we're done with the study. But this introduces this word of hope that there is someone out there who's speaking the word of God. And we have hope that we might be able to respond. That's the introduction. Okay, now we have two bookends within the first one. And the bookends are identified as Ahaz, the faithless king, and he runs from chapter 7 through 12. And then there's uh, independent segments in between. And the other bookend is Hezekiah, an almost faithful king. Now, Ahaz is a mess. And if you're from the South, you, you know what that expression means. He's, he's, he's a mess, that man. And he is the perfect example of someone who doesn't trust Yahweh and not only gets himself into tons of trouble, he leads the people of God into tons of trouble. And all of these chapters are consumed with, don't do that, don't do that. And he does it anyway. Okay, that's our faithless king. And he's bookend number one. And by the time we're done with him, we're hopeless, right? How in the world are we ever going to get out of this mess? But then he's paralleled by his four. King Hezekiah, whose name you have known probably again since you were knee high to a grasshopper because he's a reformer. He's a faithful man. He loves the kingdom of God and he is faithful to Yahweh. And so he steps into a very similar scenario. And every time you respond with, yes, Hezekiah, way to go. Good. Right there. And he almost gets us to the point where, yes, yes. Oh, not quite. <laughs> and so although it's a word of hope, it still ends this first half of the book with we need a better plan. And so the second half of the book opens. And the second half of the book, now after Israel has been dragged off into exile, has lost so much. Chapter 40 opens with Yahweh crying out in the broken silence. Comfort, oh comfort my people, says your God. Tell them that they paid the price, they served their sentence, and I am restoring them tenfold. This is Isaiah chapter 40, and it parallels the first introduction. So where's the first introduction was the problem. The second introduction is, you guessed it, the solution. <laughs> and whereas the problem was Israel and her unrepentant sin and her inability to clean up her own act, the solution is Yahweh's new plan. And one of the, the themes that we're going to have to chase down here is that Israel was identified as God's servant, right? Mm -hmm. And as God's servant, Israel failed over and over and over again. So what are we going to need for stage two? We're going to need a new servant, aren't we? We're going to need a new servant who will not fail. A new servant who will stare disobedience and death in the face and say, not on my watch. And he will be the hero of the second half of the book. Now, he's going to have a foil, too. And his foil is the idol. And so 44 through 53, we're going to go back and forth between the servant and the idol. Which one will you serve? Which choice will you make? We'll pass through uh, the restoration of Israel and the nations, and we'll major on these final chapters. The summary of all. Can we fix this? Is there a chance is, is there life in the future? Is there light at the end of time? Well, is there any reason to believe in the future? And Isaiah will end this amazing collection with Kendall Lamb going in a single day? Yes, it can. Because this is a God of miracles. This is a God who creates. And so this is a God who can recreate. So this is our prophet. This is our book. You are going to see this map at the beginning of every week's study. And as you see this map at the beginning of every week's study, it's going to have two purposes. Um, the first one is to help bring all these pieces together, right? This is a really complex book, 66 chapters. And honestly, I think Isaiah probably had two or three PhDs by the time he was done. He's the smartest man. And his rhetoric, 
right over your head. So it's going to help you put the pieces together. But the other thing it's going to do for you, and this is my heart's cry, that after you finish this study, you're going to be able to open up this book of Isaiah to any chapter, any passage, and you're going to be able to say, I know where I am. I know where I am. And since I know where I am, I know how to get where I'm going. That's what this uh, map is for, and hopefully that is the function it will serve in your study. We look at this book, and we listen to this book, and we hear our ancient prophet. He is crying out to an ancient audience. Will you hear the voice of your God, and will you respond? It's not too late. And we, a modern audience, want to be able to respond with, I am in. Hands and feet, head and shoulders, I am in. Behold, the former things have come to pass. Now I declare to you new things. And before they spring forth, I declare them to you. Hmm. I got everything on. <laughs> yeah. Pretty straightforward, wasn't it? <laughs> right. Again, lots of good things and stuff too. This spring mm -hmm. beats all. Um, and I'll get you the other copy for that we gave you. Um, again, and the, there's so much good information and stuff too, but just like any other Bible um, study and stuff too, continue to process, looking over, thinking about it. Uh, she's got lots of good information. Um, again, I'm a note taker, and it's like, I want to see more on the screen you know, yeah. to copy everything. Um, so. So trying to get that, and this is for you too, if you want to say, we got a bigger one. So, um, but but trying to get those details and stuff too. So what did you hear about Isaiah, either that was new or that was like, yep, that, that's, you know, that, that's what I, I like about Isaiah, or that's what I want to know about Isaiah. What did you hear? It was all new to me. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It was awesome. all new to me. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As we look at that, that understanding. So what was interesting then, if it's new to you, how to, a challenge, either one. Well, just I, his part in history, mm -hmm. his part in the history of the Bible. All right. Anybody else? It ain't over until it's over. Yeah. <laughs> and again, the amazing gift that that is you know, that God still is offering us the gift of salvation. You know, Isaiah had shared about it, you know, years ago, Jesus died on the cross years ago. It's not over. We still have that gift to that we can have ourselves as well as what we can share, you know. Uh, and I don't know about John, how many sermons he has that are so good that they we record, you know, but think of how much he had, Isaiah had shared and preached and then, this is how this much, you know, even though 66 chapters is a lot, it's not near as, you know, how much we spoke. They, you know, he chose, they chose the, um, what they thought was the best in the message, you know, so um, I'm sure we can all make books from our sermons. So, mm -hmm. or Ron, all your sermons that you preach. So yeah. yeah, we can make a book from it and, and share that, but, but the passion, you know, of what Isaiah share, right? Other things that you've learned just from, her message so far. A place for everything and everything in its place. Mm -hmm. I like to think linearly anyway. That's great. If, we, if we're only seeing 1%, where's the other 99? <laughs> Is it stuck away in an old monastery someplace? I don't know. That'd be exciting. Okay. I liked when she said the God of second chances, because from time to time, we all need a second chance. In fact, that was the title of the sermon on Sunday at Trinity. And it's not just the idea of a second chance to salvation, but it's a second chance to serve. And have you ever thought about that? Because God called, like one of the people that I use it as an example was Jonah. God called Jonah and he went the other way and God called Jonah again and he went and he ended up, well, he ended up as a character in the Bible because he did, but you know, God continues to call and, but we don't all say, here I am. 
with that it's called 70 so. years <laughs> <laughs> Uh, all right, other comments? If we've been blessed with uh, a second chance, that can also influence our attitude toward others. It should. Yes. Mm -hmm. That brings up forgiveness, doesn't it? Not just us. Being I was forgiven. thinking about others. And right. God forgives us. Yeah. Not just us being forgiven, but us forgiving yeah. mm -hmm. other people. Some people say, I can forgive, but I won't forget. I thought, do you really forget? <laughs> <laughs> and in uh, biblical settings, they sometimes break Isaiah into three books book one, book two, and book three, with the first being about his life. And then the second, just as she did, about the exile. And then finally, the third, about the restoration. And one thing I wrote down about the restoration is Yahweh's future plan for Israel. She wrote, she had that on there, but there was something else that Pastor Jeannie talked about. And that was, and the world. And not just for Israel, but a plan to save everyone who puts their faith and trust. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was going to say, Paul gave us the forgiveness for the Gentiles. So mm -hmm. That we live living under grace. We're not living under the Jewish law like this guy is. Right. Okay. So learning more about Isaiah, there's and the, many things that she talked about too. That again, I'm a note taker as well, and I've already watched it once. But um, she talked about the. Um, let me find my notes again. The barriers. So the barriers of reading the Bible. So history. Everybody know all the history of all the Old Testament, New Testament, and everybody the feeling of that. Everybody had the history of the United States. Everything that went on, that actually went on, and not just what was written that we learned from in grade school and high school. No. Everybody know the history of our church. Everything that's gone on. The great things and the not so great thing. No, I mean, so understanding and learning the history is still an important part of growing, you know, growing individually as our church and denomination, growing an understanding of the Bible and stuff too. That learning the history is an important part of understanding the Bible. And then she had geography. So, do we have any people really good in geography? Brett. Okay. <laughs> And how about geography 2,700 years ago? <laughs> yeah. A little more I mean, challenging geography there. Geography schools. <laughs> yeah. And again, the, the you know, different things that have an understanding of that. You know, when Jesus traveled to somewhere, do we understand? That wasn't just a walking down the road a little yeah. bit, you know. It's Three huge, or four huge, days or yeah, more. Yeah. Huge things and stuff, too. And we when they talk about going up to Jerusalem, it's not that it was north. That, that it was up you know, to get to it mm -hmm. is up a hill. It is higher you know, so understanding geography is important. And then the third is genre. Uh, again, the understanding of different books are written different ways. Um, are they are they poems or stories? Are they history? You know, are they, you know what is the, the type of book that we're reading? Again, this is writing as a prophet and sharing sermons, sharing the messages. You know, other books are written different ways. So understanding that the letters, you know, are written different than just sermons. Um, again, there's still this, uh, the same message, same as passion, um, but understanding of how it's written and to pray for things going on when they're <laughs> when the police or in, emergency <laughs> are called. So, so th those are important things, too, as we continue to study the Bible. And we don't stop learning and growing from those. There's no person that understands everything yet. And God helps us to grow if we're willing to do that about all those understandings as well as the scripture. And again, an important part of all of this is praying before you read scripture and asking the Holy Spirit to help guide you. You know, those are important practical things that will help us understand more. But again, an important part of reading scripture, including Isaiah, you know, is making sure that we're praying before we're reading. I forget sometimes too, you know, I've got to get my Bible done. I got to do my, check off my list is my work, you know, check off my work list and to pray before we read and ask God to guide us. What do we need to hear 
this particular day. And whether you've read the Bible many times or just starting on your first time, but, but asking God, what should I listen to today? So that's an important part as we go through all of this as well, asking God to guide us through the Holy Spirit. And so as you have done your um, you know, assignments and stuff too, um, sharing in that, again, each one of us may write down or, or you know, look at things slightly different. But again, if it's God guiding us, then that's a great thing to share. It's a great thing to learn. It's a great thing to grow. It's a great thing to continue for us to do. So, um, so those are exciting steps that we have as we continue looking at this Bible. Um, quickly too, as we talked, um, we shared last week. Um, so we're starting with Isaiah. We will take a break and do Lenten Bible study then. So for Lent, which starts on Ash Wednesday, which is Valentine's Day, yeah. February 14th. Um, so, but we will have, you know, start a, a Lenten Bible study, um, finish that till Easter, and then we'll go back to Isaiah. So, so you're aware of that too, that we're not, we're not stopping it. But we're taking a break from it for a little while so we can do a Lenten Bible study and prepare for Easter. Yeah. And so some of the other things that we see, and she talked about it, Pastor Amy just talked about it, is context. And her example of the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King, I mean, we understand that because we have a much better understanding of the situation at the time when he was speaking and the situation that he was speaking about, even though it goes back 400 years. But so that's the historical context. And then Pastor Jeannie used the word genre and the different types of biblical genre. And there's a literary context, too. How did they write? They write it. We write a letter one way. We write a technical piece of uh, information another way. And so we write fiction and there's all sorts of different genres. And if we don't understand what those genres are, we we struggle to make sense out of what's going on. And, you know, I, even going back to Jesus day, that's 2000 years, we still struggle with the context then. And we know so much more about 2000 years ago than we do about 2700 years ago. So it, it's really important and she's gonna, she says she's going to take care of helping us with that. <laughs> so we'll have to hold her to that <laughs> because I, I'm not a biblical, Old Testament biblical scholar that teaches that at places like Harvard and Asbury, like she is. So uh, we'll have to leave, leave that to her. Uh, well, the cultural and racial aspects are also in there somewhere. Mm -hmm. yeah, and important. All, all these things that separate us from that time and separate us from the understanding. Yeah, it's it it is challenging and it will continue to be challenging but i think she did a good job of kind of uh, laying out isaiah and gave us this she called it a map but this structure for the book so that we have a little bit better and we see maybe can have a grasp the big picture a little bit easier yeah any other comments from what she had shared before we get to our assignment assignments? Mm -hmm. so I read into that, you know, what she shared, Isaiah is not a biography. So mm -hmm. in the Bible, again, while it talks about people and individual things, the Bible is about God. And that's important for the, us to remember every time we read, you know. We read about all kinds of people. We read about all kinds of stories, different kinds of events. It's all about God. Some things, again, when people say, you know, everything in the Bible is true, which it is. But some things are true that we shouldn't do. You read things that they did, they their decisions, their things that we, we shouldn't do those. You know, back when they sacrificed children, their infants, that's in the Bible, right? It's something we shouldn't do, you know, so there's things that we should learn from of not to do, and there's certain things that we should learn to do. So that's all part of reading the scripture, understanding 
what is the message that we're supposed to have? What is God wanting us to know from that? So. I thought it was interesting in reading this. It's the way that she's laid it out and that she's going to help us with that context. Because when I was reading in Samuel and, and they were talking about, you know, he's going to eat his wife and his children and then there she's going to, you know, and I'm like, what in the world? Is this some euphemism for something? So I'm looking down and the, you know, the explanation, no, it really says cannibalism there. And like that is just so far removed. And then you think about, you know, like why would God, you know, have the, you know, why would he put that curse on him? But then she said later in she kind of explained that that it wasn't like God putting a curse on him. It was just God not protecting them and letting human nature that was just what was going to happen if without his hand of protection. Mm -hmm. And so that was kind of helpful. Um, but you're right. We are just so far removed. That's just so not in my everyday life. Right. That mm -hmm. I think about every day um, that that would even happen. So I think this is going to just be very interesting and, and helpful in, in just guiding us along to understanding what's actually going on. She's a hundred percent right. I never thought of it before about, not hearing the whole conversation you're only hearing one side of it and i never thought of that before but it, it does make a lot of sense and it does kind of help put things in perspective a little bit pastor dini and our conversations talked about the importance and the first question that we were supposed to answer this week about the characters in one samuel 9 and 10 and it's the five W's, who, what, when, where, why, and how. I know five and <laughs> one that's not. And as Pastor Jeannie was saying, we should be first always be looking for, whenever we read, always looking for God. Always. When we're reading in the Bible. And, you know, you read Esther and it never says God. But if you can't find God in Esther, you're not looking very young. So... You know, you, you always want to see what God is doing, because if you see what God is doing, then you'll probably come up with a question like, why is he doing that? And, you know, sometimes it seems like, as Diane was perhaps alluding to, that he's a, he's a little bit capricious or, but a lot of times, rather than being capricious, we see that he is behaving in response to people and what they've done. And, you know, there's something about Amalekites in, in this story, and we are in our lesson this week. And so, you know, we, as Diane was talking about, we see that it's really strange that God would do, take such an action. But a lot of times when people do what they are, though they aren't supposed to, whether they know God or not, the consequences of their actions are self-fulfilling. You know, if in our modern culture, we could say, look at people who probably know that they aren't supposed to buy drugs on the street and inject them or take them into their body. And there are consequences for doing that and those consequences don't just affect them they affect their parents they affect the generations after and so sometimes god leaves us to the consequences it's not that he won't, won't try to save their soul and won't send people to save their soul but you know you there are consequences for what we do well, let's turn to page eight eight in your Isaiah book. And so if you answer those questions and have either wrote on there or wrote in on your notebook and going over those. So again, the kind of the process of how we can continue to go. And we want to make sure we try to get through these two assignments before four o'clock so we don't stay too long. So, so what are the characters involved in the readings in chapters nine and ten of first Samuel? Anybody? Ish and his son, Saul. Okay. 
who was a head taller than everyone else and was a handsome man. <laughs> <laughs> and there's Samuel, mm -hmm. a group of prophets out there. Any others of anybody on? The Spirit of the Lord. And I didn't know how detailed this was supposed to be because mm -hmm. I said the girls giving directions. Mm -hmm. They ran into two men, then they ran into three men, and then there was a gentleman at the end also. Yeah, again, Saul and Samuel are the main character, but there's, again, other people that are important in the understanding of the rest of the story as well. So, right? And then again, important thing, Yahweh, which is God. What does Yahweh tell Samuel to do? Anoint Saul as a leader of these people. So what's anoint mean? Almost like taking your magic wand. He anoint us by head with oil. Right. <laughs> okay. What do you anoint with oil for? What's the reason for it? Maybe purity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anything else? <laughs> so have you ever been prayed over and anointed baptized that's close okay <laughs> that's an important part that you're an important person of god again so why was um saul anointed as something why did samuel anoint saul what was the specific reason a french oh i'm sorry go ahead no go ahead the leader Lily, yeah, the leader. Okay. So he was going to be the leader there. So, but two things does Samuel do to Saul to announce him as king or the leader? He anoints him with all, with oil and kisses him. I don't know if he made such a smacking noise as I just <laughs> Probably not. So, you said anoint with oil. What was the other? Kiss him. Yeah, and then kissed him. So, okay, there's other parts in the Bible too that talk about how important that we should kiss each other. And uh, as, as believers, as people of faith, and I know, you know, nowadays sometimes I think that that, that would be, you know, but, but there's biblical. In our society. There is biblical statements that talk about important, uh, you know, again, they didn't have cheek. COVID back then. <laughs> <laughs> that too. So, but, but, but kissing was an important part of not just love in in today's context, but truly God's love and you know, respect. Think of the importance of a kiss in Jesus' life. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, different. When he was marked. Well, yeah. Arabs yeah. do it all the time. <laughs> Your kisses, men, you know, it's it's a culture. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to mafia. <laughs> oh. <laughs> That's the kid that's death. <laughs> that's different, right? <laughs> Again, my next think, culture to say, if you think about that kiss of death, where did that start? Jesus. 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 Which was, as, and again, it's not just his death, death, then life. Mm -hmm. Resurrection. But, you know, so it will be the, the, all, all the next parts, too, that will be. Um, God's plan. So, what does Yahweh through Samuel command Saul to do to the Amalekites? Destroy, destroy everything. Wow. How do you feel about that one? Everything. Even the animals. Even the animals. <laughs> and the animals. Men, women, children, uh, every animal. That's what you're supposed to do. How do you feel about that? That's a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> It's surprising when you always think of our Lord being a very loving person mm -hmm. for him to command him and, to do that. And why was it then? To wipe out. He didn't <laughs> want him to enter, enter mix. And because? They would influence him into the idols. That's right. The evil. The evil. Again, the, the, what they were worshiping, the idols, the evil that they were doing, the complete wrong You've got to wipe all that. Again, they talk later about don't marry the women, you know, who were worshiping idols, who were of different religions, because they will, which again, as we'll see, right. bring in <laughs> the idols. So um, now the animals and stuff too, again, 
they were not the holy things. They were not to be sacrificed. They were not not to be used again because they were the evil people. They were not, you know, don't take advantage of it. They're, they're not yours. You don't need those, you know, but, but it's a difficult concept for us to think of. But, I mean, they're just animals, right? They, they didn't choose on who owned them or who, you know, who was taking care of them. Right, right yeah. And, but, but Israel had this whole inability to trust God to provide. And so if they're taking things rather than waiting for God to provide, they're showing that they really aren't dependent upon God and they don't have faith that God will take care of their needs. Mm -hmm. so. so even today for missionaries, you know, there've been some, you know, go overseas, don't take things with you. You don't need, you know, I'll provide. Do you take a little money? Do you take this? Do you make sure you people send people? Uh, you yeah. have four suitcases to tag along. <laughs> or do you, you know. <laughs> again, th there'll be other opportunities for us that we may go through some things like, do we truly trust God in the provision and God's plan? Or would you think, no, we've got a better one. And that doesn't make sense, God, when God specifically says things, which goes to the next question. How does Saul disobey Yahweh's command? <laughs> he allows the people to... He saves the king as a trophy. Yeah. And, the and the best life. Yeah. yeah. The animals. Yeah. Which it kind of seemed like in the first, when they were first talking about it, that Saul was doing it. And then when Samuel called him one, he's like, no, the people did it. Yeah. Oh my God. It's, it's all happened to us. It. <laughs> it's like, okay, did we just change our story here? <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> Get caught and then have a new story. So, do you know anybody else again in the Old Testament that made some, um, did not listen to God and had certain things completely taken away then? Adam. <laughs> Ananias <laughs> and Sapphira. Oh. Ooh, Ananias and Sapphira. Yeah. 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 And it, I think in that one, and maybe that's what we're seeing with Saul here a little bit, it's new beginnings are hard. And so God tells Saul to do a certain thing right at the yeah. beginning, and there was disobedience. We saw the same thing with Joshua, I think in chapter 27 or so, where someone takes up the plunder, and then we see it with Ananias and Sapphira, what they're doing is they're presenting something falsely to God and all these are new beginnings. And in these new beginnings, if you corrupt something at the beginning, how do you ever get it right again? Yeah. I was thinking of Moses too. Again, there's several different things. Moses you know, hit the rock instead of just doing what God told him to do and saying, here's the water, you know, um, and he didn't get to see it. He didn't, didn't get to go to the promised land. He did get to see it. But he also was satisfied because he knew he'd been wrong. So at least he got to see the promised land. He was okay with God's plan and God's, you know, um, what what God had done for his disobedience. So, uh, so uh, and the result of Saul's disobedience? He was a king anymore. <laughs> Yeah, again, not immediately, right? Right. Because there's different things that happen. But yeah, he is rejected as king. Okay. Yeah. You're not going to listen. You know, which is important for us to remember. <laughs> and uh, that there are consequences to our decisions and stuff, too. Uh, what does Samuel do and announce to Saul? Yeah. You have to talk a little bit louder. God cause... regretted making him king. Okay. And. <laughs> was going to find a replacement. Yeah. All right. Anything else that he did? It was a physical thing that he did. He gave the kingdom to someone else. Mm -hmm. He tore his robe was one of the physical right. things. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Like, again, historical context, understanding that that's a huge thing. Um, when when you tear your robe, it's it's depression, it's it's sadness, 
uh, for, for Jews, for the Old Testament, for when you tear that, yeah, mourning, it, M-O-U-R-N, <laughs> that, you know, it is, is something. So when he tears the robe, it, it, it's a big thing. It, it's not just a disrespectful, like tearing your clothes. It, it means a message. So understanding that when they tear the robe, you know, yeah, it, it means a lot. This, this You have saddened God. You saddened him. I mean, saddened Samuel as well, that Saul uh, didn't follow that. So, all right. Uh, whom does Yahweh send Samuel after Saul's rejection as king? Jesse. Mm -hmm. Jesse. He sent it to Jesse. Okay. Is that who's going to be king? No. Who's going to be king? David. David, yeah. So Jesse's <laughs> son. Yeah, so he sent them to Jesse uh, and goes through all the, the sons. Uh, and he didn't get to see who's going to be king until he asked. <laughs> right. Is there one more? <laughs> yeah. So, and the youngest gets to be king, which doesn't make sense. Again, historically, Jewish wise, Hebrew wise, the youngest was not be the first to, you know, to have the leadership. Usually be the oldest, the best, you know. First. If you're the oldest, are you the best? Anybody the oldest here? <laughs> All right, okay. <laughs> You guys are the are best, so, but no. but anyway, again, in in their culture, it wouldn't have been to have to choose, but it was God's plan to do that. So He chooses Samuel, uh, and what does Samuel do to David? Anoint him. He anoints him. Okay, again, the next step as well. He is anointed. This will be the king. Not immediately. There's things he's going to go through. And if you read it through other things, you'll find out even more. But that's, again, understanding the history, God's plan. God still has a plan and a purpose for all that. So, And um, in God's government, who has the authority to make and break kings? Who's in charge? Yeah, Samuel is from, takes orders from God. So what is Samuel's position? Prophet. Prophet. Okay. Okay. So what are the prophets called today? Speak for God. Mm -hmm. Is that what you ask about? What do prophets do? Mm -hmm. What are Speak. prophets called today? Oh. People who are speaking for from God, for God, to people. You go to God yourself. Yeah. <laughs> But there are people who are called by God to speak. Oh, priests? Yeah. <laughs> preachers. <laughs> and that's why us pastors, as a part of our continuing education, went to the school of the prophets <laughs> in the old oh, days. Yeah. yeah. That's right. What? That was in Indianapolis, wasn't it? Yes. Okay. What was the college you went to? So. I, I went to Indiana State and Chicago State, so and then Asbury Seminary. So. Did you go to that one in Indianapolis? Christian Theological Seminary and then Asbury, but we went to the School of Prophets. Right, I so. think that was held at Indiana Central oh, okay. so. in the day. Hmm. But that's an awesome feeling, you know, to be labeled as a prophet. Me? And a great responsibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're a spokesman. All right, we want to go to day three, which is page 11. So this is a look at the Ten Commandments. And if you hadn't figured that out, this is the first appearance of most of the Ten Commandments in the Old Testament. And this is when Charlton Heston brings them down on the stones and the first time he brings them down he throws them down but he brings them down and so the first question is what does Yahweh say that he is Yahweh gives a little bit of a description of himself he says I am Lord your God the Lord your God and he's establishing position he could have said I am the creator and you are the creation. I have all authority over you. I decide when you live and when you die. Everything that you have is from me. 
So when we think about that and we think about what God commanded of the Amalekites, it is his will and his choice for what happens. Question number two. I put numbers beside I did too. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what does Yahweh say that he had done? Brought the people out of Egypt mm -hmm. out of slavery. Pretty big deal to get their attention, isn't it? Yeah. They have been in slavery for 430 odd years. They have been in Egypt that long and probably enslaved for 400 or so of them. And so he freed them. My biggest problem, they didn't want to go. <laughs> well, they they were wet with dragging their feet right. and they stayed foot draggers for quite a while. And repeating that story you know, throughout scripture is why it, it was so important. Don't forget what God did. You know, there's many different places where it talks about the, taking them out of Egypt and freeing them from slavery. It's an important message. You know, so we need to know that too. It's an important message that we're free from the slavery of sin because of what Christ did. Amen. And so continue telling those stories. Well, and if you go to Stephen in Acts, he tells that story to the Sanhedrin yeah. because he wants to add on to the portion of it that that wasn't the end of the story. He went on to tell them about what Christ did. Sometimes we don't think we have a story to tell. <laughs> All right, number three. What is the first commandment Yahweh gives to Israel? No other gods before yeah. him. No gods before me. Luckily, we don't have any other gods, do we? Does our culture worship anything besides the one true God? Outside of money. <laughs> Cell phones. What? Cell phones. Cell phones. <laughs> Celebrities. Everything, really. Everything. Yeah. Everything but almost sometimes it seems like. Yeah. So we look at these people and say, well, how could you... I mean, you've got this God that's a big pillar of fire going before you. How could you take up a stick and worship a stick or a coffee table? How could you miss it? But how are we any different? Because <laughs> we have the same story. Yeah. We even have more story. Yeah. So let's see. That was the first part. First commandment. What does this communicate about the relationship between Yahweh and Israel? Priority. Priority, absolutely. The first four commandments <clears throat> are all about God. So uh, after establishing who he is, what obligations or expectations does Yahweh place on Israel? Underline them or list them here. So no gods before me. That was the first one. No, I don't. Well, the fir first four. Yeah refer well the next three refer back to the first one right right they, they, they kind of uh add a little bit more how this relationship is supposed to go yeah. yeah no images of god no graven images however you want to say it no golden calves <laughs> you know no worshiping benjamin franklin on green and white paper uh, what else? Those first four. No taking the Lord's name in vain and oh. reserve the Sabbath. So, no Lord's name in vain and remember the Sabbath. Yeah. And how about uh, what else? Honor your mother and father. Why? They this both. is the this is the first command with a promise. That's why I'm asking. Well, the last six relate to how you get along with everybody. Each else. other, yeah. absolutely. First four are with God. The last six are how we behave to fathers and mothers. Each other. Why we honor our mother and father because it will go well with you. Well, the family unit is the most important unit in a culture. 
civilization. All right, and how about that next one? It's a little bit trickier. Do not. Do not. Murder. Murder? Let's, let's fix it. Murder. Because some places say kill. Yeah. But that is not a correct translation. It's do not murder. Do not take a life for personal gain is how we might describe murder. And respect so, life. What? Respect life. Well, that would be, and I did a sermon once on the Ten Commandments from a positive as opposed to a do not, what you should do instead. And that would be respect life, love one another. Okay, what else? Do not murder. Covet. Don't covet. Boy, how do we survive without coveting in our culture, in our country? Because, I mean, it, every commercial is teaching us to covet. Well, and it even tells you you're worth it. All right. <laughs> It'll be okay this time. <laughs> Any others that we're missing? Lie. What? Lie. Lie! <laughs> no one in here's ever told a lie, have they? <laughs> I'm thinking. <laughs> if you say yes, you just did. <laughs> if I did, it was a white <laughs> Not steal, not commit adultery. And I heard, well, actually, I read it in a Stephen King book where in the stand where uh, the old lady who's the the stand-in for God who has great faith says that all of these are about stealing what's God's, whether it's mm -hmm. his honor or mm -hmm. sitting against him. I thought that was kind of interesting, but all right, we don't need to talk any more about Stephen King. <laughs> <laughs> Number five, now read Deuteronomy 27, 11, to 28, 68, focusing on 28, such and such and such and such and such and <laughs> such. Everybody read those? Anybody have any comments about any of it? That's exactly how I read it. <laughs> such and such and no. such and such. <laughs> instead of tripping up all over those names. <laughs> but, but I think the two answers to the next two questions are, are pretty simple, though, in my opinion. Longevity. <laughs> Blessing. Blessing. Blessing or curse. Yeah. Yeah. Walk with me. Be blessed. Go off on your own. Be cursed. Yeah, living that. <laughs> You know, continuing following that, making sure we're doing that. Again, that takes prayer. It takes listening to the power of the Holy Spirit to make sure we continue to follow and obey his commandments. And we will know blessing. Um, and when we disobey, um, again, just sharing a prayer request though, um, at Hope House, one of the young gentlemen um, went back to drinking, um, went back to, you know, doing something that wasn't right. So he's going to know the curses from that. So uh, as he shared, uh, reading the God's word and, and he was knowing the blessing right. and now he's made a mistake again. So, so praying and lifting up everybody and it's all of us, you know, but especially some of the folks like that, uh, uh, making those poor choices of going back to something that's terrible for them and others. Um, and, and they're going to know a difficult time. So praying that they will continue to follow God and all of us will, and we will know the blessings. But it, it, it hurt me when I found out that, like, why isn't he here? Oh, okay. So, so try praying for all those. Well, and, you know, we, we all know people, my nephew, who, and lots of other people 
on Funk Houser, who yeah. was on such a great path. He was on fire. He was on fire for Christ. And then he overdosed and is dead. Yeah. And, you know, I... consequences and even it's so easy to go astray and so for us to truly continue to care uh, understanding god's word and sharing god's word and pointing them to god and god's word will make a difference and so i'm hoping again what that man read <laughs> you're getting on his head for brian hurts they don't even check for marijuana or cocaine because everybody's on it so they don't even check for it or they'd have no employees. Yeah. It'll wow. probably be legal in Indiana again. Oh, anyway. But it's a shame. But mm -hmm. no matter what. So next week? Next week we will do, do we have lesson number session number two, week two. It's called the Office of the Prophet. And we will do all three lessons. We're out talking about So next week, all three lessons. Lessons. That's combined of session and lesson. All three lessons for week two. And then I don't know whether we'll go through all of them question by question, but what is next week? I didn't write the right one down. Week it's two. Week oh, week two. two. Oh, okay. Day two. So if we're up through 25, we'll leave there. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. Did you trust me with that? <laughs> this started to get I mean, it, so it, it's <laughs> been, yeah. oh, week two, everything between where it says week, week two and, and week three, three. Yeah. everything in between there. Oh, week two. Week week two, week two, two, two okay. okay. All right, let's pray. Gracious God Almighty, we are so grateful that your word continues to speak to our hearts and minds. And we, we even thank you for the warmer weather outside and pray for safety yeah. as people deal with fog and uh, different concerns. And we pray for all those uh, that are dealing with surgery, dealing with cancer, dealing with uh, other health issues and uh, concerns. And we know that you care about them. And so help us to care with a passion as well. So we praise you as we continue to, to listen to your voice and grow in our understanding. And as we care for others, we thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I asked about a video. Here, Ron, I have a video. Ron said you were talking on the phone and you missed it. No, no, no. That what You saw the video. Was I in here? Yeah. Yes. Sarah Richter. Sarah Richter. San Sandra Richter. Oh, Sandra. okay. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'm thinking like the chosen.